Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. Today we're going to be speaking about food safety and the importance of food safety. I'm here with Steve Flint, who is a professor of food safety at Massey University in New Zealand. Welcome. Hi, Steve. Well, I love your name. Oh, it's good. <laughs> well, Steve, if we could say, uh, if we could start by talking about food safety. Um, I understand why food safety is important if I go uh, to a restaurant or I go to the supermarket, but why is food safety important on a broader level? Well, the fact is that people can die from a food safety incident, so it is that serious. And in terms of products that are sold um, to um, other food manufacturers as ingredients for their products, um, or um, sold to be stored for a long period of time, so this is not restaurant food, uh, but food is a, it's a commodity before the consumers actually get it. Um, those foods can be sitting around for quite a period of time and the danger there is that whatever's in those foods can grow and grow to a level that's going to cause a serious incident. And so what can you as a professor do about that or what can food safety regulators do about that? Well there's many different ways of trying to control food safety. Regulation is one of many. Um, it's not actually the best way of doing it. I think we're over-regulated in the food industry. Uh, but there's a lot we still don't know about how different pathogens that cause food safety issues interact with the foods that we have today. One of the big, biggest challenges that we have is that people are now demanding foods with less preservatives, less processing, um, and that's a challenge for us because uh, food needs to be preserved in some way. And by taking out the preservatives and taking away some of the processing methods that were designed to make food safe, we're actually generating a greater risk to the consumer as a result of that. But what are we supposed to do then? I mean not have preservatives and then how does the food basically, how, it, how does it last for more than a couple of days while it travels to where it needs to go? Well that is the problem. It's, it's real, a real challenge for us to find alternative methods to make foods that are so called natural and, and don't have the added preservatives that people do not want. I think part of the control, as we mentioned before, we were talking about regulation. Um, I think the other aspect that's important in food safety is education and educating the public that the preservatives are not always bad. And in fact, if we didn't have preservatives and we didn't have food processing, processing techniques such as pasteurisation, uh, we would be in a very serious situation. All foods, all raw foods, have the potential to cause food safety issues. And unless we process them or preserve them in some way, um, then we're at risk of, of having some serious sickness. Well, what about sushi? Uh, sushi. That, yep. My understanding is that there's always that warning, at least yes. in, my, in my country, there's always a warning that says, be careful. Uh, but is, is there more of a, a risk when you're eating sushi compared to other foods? Almost oh, definitely. Sushi is a food that um, contains a lot of seafood. Um, it's a food that's prepared with a lot of manual labour. And it's a food that we can only really control through refrigeration. So refrigeration is one of the techniques that we use to actually slow the progress of microbial um, contamination and growth in a food. Um, and that's the key process by which we ensure that a product like sushi is safe. It has a very limited shelf life, and we have to respect that as, as consumers. What about, other, what about bread, for instance? Well, bread is a bit different because of the, the nature of the product. It's a dried product. Uh, there's a term called water activity, which relates to the amount of moisture in a product. Bread being a dried product is a lot safer than a moist product like sushi. And so we can get away with a lot of, or a longer shelf life in a product like bread um, from the food safety point of view than in a product like sushi. And what about, uh, to bring this to the university level, so mm -hmm. would I learn that if I were a food safety student? Most definitely, yes. You'd be learning about what we call the extrinsic and intrinsic properties of a product. So the nature of a product and the properties of that product that either make it more safe or less safe in terms of the growth of microorganisms that can cause food safety issues. And so, for instance, so can you unpack that a little bit, if you wouldn't mind? So, yeah. so, so what courses would I take if I were a student in, in, your, in your department? Okay. Well, there's a number of different ways we can go. Probably the primary way is a food technology degree program, which is a four-year honours program. And within that program, you learn about um, the engineering of uh, food manufacture. You learn about uh, developing new food products. Um, and you learn some core food safety principles So. A, a special food safety paper that we teach as part of the program. So it's quite a comprehensive program and all those uh, papers I just mentioned combine to ensure that the graduate of the food technology program understands how to make food safe. But I, as you're saying this, I'm thinking about washing my hands. 
Yes. Right. I mean, you know, the old adage, you should wash your hands yes, before you... Yes, I know, I know. And this is something that people are absolutely paranoid about, is washing their hands. Now, I don't want to put people off washing their hands, because that is still important. And I could talk a lot about washing hands, just that one topic. But it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is, is to remember that everything around us has the potential to contaminate food. And your hands are a very minor part of that. Um, in, in fact, the, the microflora on your hands are not always dangerous. Some may be, some may not be. Uh, but the most, one of the most dangerous things you can do in preparing food is have processed food or heat treated food or you know, food that's been um, made safe by cooking in contamination with raw food. And that in a kitchen environment or in a food manufacturing environment is a huge risk to food safety, more so than, wash, than making sure your hands are clean and washed. So what should you do besides washing your hands then? Well, the main thing is to make sure that you have raw foods and cooked foods completely separate. Whether you're in a food manufacturing plant where you're manufacturing a large amount of product for export, or whether you're in a restaurant kitchen uh, where you're preparing food for the customers. Both, in both those environments, those extreme environments, uh, pre preventing the contamination of cooked food with raw food is, is a very important um, part of food safety. Interesting. And if we can pivot a little bit to the issue of, of, of kind of security and food mm. safety, because if you think about it, I mean, it could be a, a, a disaster if, if, if water would be contaminated or, oh, yeah. or certain food items would be contaminated. Yeah, exactly. Um, especially if you're making foods for large numbers of people. And this is one of the things that we do in New Zealand. We're a food manufacturing um, country and we're exporting to the world and we're exporting large volumes of product to the world. So we have the potential to cause sickness in a huge number of people. Uh, you talked about water. Water is absolutely critical. And if water is contaminated, water comes into contact with people every day, with foods every day. We drink water, it's used in the cooking of food, used in the washing of food, used in the washing of food manufacturing plants. It's an absolute key ingredient right throughout the whole food chain. Um, it must meet standards that are what we call potable, potable water, so it's drinkable water. In fact, in the food industry, food manufacturing industry, we state that it should be better than that because the water that's put into a product as an ingredient, which we do in many cases, um, or used to wash a product, like a lettuce leaf, for example, um, that has potential to contaminate that food product. And that food product, when it's stored, can grow those bacteria and cause food safety issues. And we would be able to figure out if, let's say, lettuce or, or certain vegetables were contaminated, we would be able to figure out where it came from? Yes, we can these days. We have some very good techniques for doing that. And that is, that's one of the step changes, I guess, that we've seen in recent years. We now have molecular techniques where we can look at the DNA of the organisms contaminating products, and we can track those organisms to a potential source. Um, it's, it's a huge issue trying to track a contaminated food um, to a, a potential source, um, mainly because if somebody becomes sick, um, the food that they consumed is long gone. So to actually get that product to sample and test can be a challenge in itself. But once we have the product and we isolate the bacteria contaminating that product, uh, we can normally track those organisms to a particular origin. Interesting. Uh, before we say goodbye, I, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a question, if I could, about uh, milk. Yes. You know, if you go to the supermarket yeah. and you buy some milk, mm -hmm. how would you possibly know if that is good milk or not? Well, all milk in New Zealand and our supermarkets, and in fact most of the world in supermarkets in general, is pasteurised. And pasteurisation will kill any food poisoning organisms in that product, so it is safe. And it has a shelf life on it, which also gives you greater assurance that that product is safe. The biggest concern we have with milk, um, certainly in this country and I think in many countries around the world, is again relating to the fact that people don't want foods that are processed, foods that have preservatives, and there's a big move towards the consumption of raw milk. Raw milk is, as I say, raw. It's just come from an animal, it's contaminated with many pathogens, and those will grow during the storage of that milk and have the potential to cause some very serious sickness. And if we look at the, the data from around the world, uh, there are many incidents where people have been consuming raw milk or raw milk products um, where there have been some huge food safety issues. So it's a matter of of knowing that the product has been treated in a certain way to make it safe. And if you're talking about milk, pasteurisation is key. Fair enough. And what about the difference between New Zealand and the United States and elsewhere? Are there different food safety protocols? Very similar, right across the world, really. Um, most of the testing and protocols that we have in New Zealand are exactly the same as they are in the States. 
Uh, so yeah, we're following very similar guidelines. And what about on an, air, an airline or if I have food on, in an airplane? Mm. That is a potentially a huge issue. If you had people on a flight, a long haul flight, that became sick with something like a norovirus, um, that could be disastrous for the people on board the aircraft. There would not be enough toilets to actually cope with all the passengers on the plane um, in, in that time of crisis. And it's something that the airlines are very, very much aware of. They have very strict procedures in terms of how they prepare the food uh, for these airline flights. Um, it's prepared fresh, it's chilled um, immediately before serving, and uh, it's looked after very well. So there are very few cases where we have issues with food safety um, on airline flights. And I guess the opposite question I would have then is, is one about, let's say, a processed uh, pretzels or mm -hmm. processed, processed potato chips that mm. you get in a, ba mm. in a bag that are made by these large companies. Mm. Are you saying that there's less of a chance for them to be uh, contaminated because they're more processed? It's kind of. Uh, when you say processed, I think what we have to go back to is the intrinsic properties of their product. They're dried baked products. Um, containing quite a lot of salt. And so we have a low water activity, there's not much water in those products. And that makes them intrinsically safe. So you'd be very, very unlikely to get a food safety issue relating to something like potato chips or pretzels. But presumably less, uh, fewer proteins that are good for you. Well, it depends. Um, I think potato chips get um, a bit of a bad rap because of the high salt. Um, and the oil that's used to, to process them. But I think some food manufacturers are getting more conscious of that and, and they're cutting back on the salt and they're also using uh, good quality oils, I think, for the processing of those products. So yes, to a certain extent, you're right. Um, but I think what you have to look at is what you are taking in in your diet on a general basis. So it's not just focusing on something like potato chips, but what else are you eating uh, to get the nourishment that you need? So this is just one of many food products that people will consume. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We're going to hear from uh, your colleague Nigel at the Food Safety Department at, at Massey University, and we'll be right back with you. Around the world, there are many, many reasons why food safety and food security have become extremely important. Uh, obviously, the human population has expanded rapidly. The ways in which we produce food, uh, manufacture food, and uh, the way we consume food has changed rapidly over the last few years. Uh, food safety is an enormous concern uh, for both developing countries as well as developed countries and there are many, many foodborne illnesses still around the world, particularly affecting children in developing countries. We have a number of hazards that are, we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis from microbiological risks or bacterial infections through to chemical risks, uh, physical hazards as well as radiological hazards. So there are many things that are of concern around the world and many factors that are contributing to that, including the huge mobility of people, food and food products, and changes in the way in which we produce food. The New Zealand government has established a centre for, uh, for two main reasons. Um, one of them is because New Zealand produces a lot of food. Um, it produces much more food than New Zealanders consume, and food exports are a major contributor to our economy. Ensuring the food that we produce is safe not only for New Zealanders but also for our international consumers is absolutely crucial for our economy. It's important for our trade in food and food products with major countries such as China and the United States and Europe um, but it's also important domestically for New Zealanders as well. We need to make sure that the food that New Zealanders consume is safe, nutritious and wholesome. So at Massey University uh, and in this particular laboratory we've been working for a number of years with the Ministry for Primary Industries and the food industry um, to protect New Zealanders against pathogens. The most important one that we've been working on has been Campylobacter. Um, work that we did in this laboratory enabled us to use molecular tools combined with modelling to identify the source of human infection. Uh, that was identified to be primarily poultry and once that was known and securely uh, established then we could uh, put measures in place in the industry to reduce the risk. That resulted in a 50% reduction in human cases and a saving to the New Zealand economy of around about $50 million per year. So the application of science to identify the source enabled us to prevent that source becoming a future so uh, cause of human infection and resulted in a lot fewer people getting sick and a big saving to the New Zealand economy. That's one example. 
Uh, other examples are work that's being done on our E. coli and exports of meat and meat products and how we can improve the situation there, again using similar tools and technology. Plus also understanding uh, the role of uh, um, listeria on food products as well. So this is another pathogen which is very important from a public health point of view. Um, work is ongoing at Massey to understand how listeria can gather together in biofilms in the industry and how we can try and reduce the impact of that by improving processing to make uh, listeria less of a problem with the industry. And also now increasingly on another issue of importance, uh, one of probably the biggest One Health issue, and One Health being that intersection between human, animal and environmental health, is around the emergence of antibiotic or antimicrobial resistance. And Massey University is playing an important role in big international efforts around uh, improving capacity of countries, particularly developing countries, to tackle the emerging problem of antibiotic resistance. Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion about food safety with two PhD students here at Massey University in New Zealand, Haran and Emmanuel. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Well, thank you both for coming on the show. Maybe if you can say a word or two about uh, what you're studying. And Haran, what are you studying here? I, um, my PhD program was to look at a bacteria that can potentially transfer to pork, um, which in the end, infect people and cause in intestinal disease. Which is bad. Which is bad, yeah. So it's more of a preventative research. And Emmanuel, your research is about? Yeah, I'm working on colonization of lettuce by Listeria monocytogenes. Listeria monocytogenes is a pathogenic bacteria, and I'm looking at how it's able to attach and colonize the surface of lettuce. These days, people eat a lot of vegetables and fresh produce and they get foodborne infections. So I'm looking at how we can control these bacteria on the surface of fresh produce like lettuce. Well, that's interesting because when I go to a lot of places, I'm often warned not to eat the lettuce because it's very hard to clean lettuce. Is yes. that true? Yes, that's true because in the industry, they use chlorine and other chlorinated compounds to wash. But the current research is proving that chlorine cannot completely eliminate all the bacteria on the surface of lettuce. So we are now looking at how we can use some novel stress response produced by the plant itself to fight off these pathogenic bacteria. And is that likely to happen? Yes, we are still looking and searching into it. But this is going to be a long time be before you finish your work with a, a team of people and then produce something on a grand scale so that way it makes it safer for the consumer today. Yeah, but you have to start from somewhere. So I'm starting and hopefully some of my colleagues will come and continue. That's interesting. And in terms of pork, you must have a different set of problems then. Um, this bacteria called Yersinia enterocritica which is not as famous as Listeria, but is still quite common both in New Zealand and worldwide. Uh, the problem of this bacteria is it can live in pork, so it can easily get, to into, get into the pork processing environment and cause cross-contamination to the pork product or infect uh, the working stuff. Well, maybe I'll ask both of you. So should I not have pork and should I not have lettuce? Well, um, this bacteria is quite heat sensitive, so, so if you still would like to consume pork, you just cook it thoroughly. Um, I don't think there will be a problem, but my, what my study um, is trying to look at is how this bacteria um, attached to surfaces in the pork processing environment, because in the pork processing environment, we're not going to cook them or heat treated them. So we look at how they attach to those surfaces and um, what environmental factors that can increase the attachment of, the, of this bacteria and we will try to um, prevent or remove whatever the factor that might be increasing the attachment of this bacteria and try to control um, the occurrence of the bacteria. That's interesting. So could, it, could the surface matter, like if it was a wood surface or a metal surface? Uh, we do see a difference 
between different surfaces. But the main surface that I use in my study at this stage is stainless steel, as it is the um, common material used in food industry. And you said about the food industry, is that also the most common material in individual kitchens when people are preparing a dinner, for instance? Well, I guess there are bigger variety at different homes. I can't really comment on that question. Sorry. Well, if you don't, I don't mean to press you on every kitchen in the world, but, but as you're saying that, I was thinking about, you know, you go to a restaurant, you go to a processing facility, but then you can also go to somebody's home and they cook some food and perhaps it, it hasn't been cooked properly or perhaps it's on a surface that, that wasn't clean. Yeah. That must be an issue all around the world. Yes, yes. So you agree with that? I agree with that. Okay. This, this is really interesting because, you know, I'm just a consumer of food. Uh, and uh, now, uh, Emmanuel, you're from Ghana. Yes. And is is this an issue as well in Ghana in terms of in terms of let's say cooking uh, uh, meats or other things uh, in in a way on on a surface that's clean? Yeah, this is an issue everywhere in the world because the um, the globe, the food production chain is a long one. A um, lot of countries import different vegetables from different parts of the world and from one place to another. So you may never know what had happened in the old country or something. So it's a, it's a big problem and these days everywhere in the world. I will advise you to grow your own lettuce in your garden and um, cook, eat them and um, do whatever you want to do because you cannot really trust what is being sold in the supermarket or in the grocery store. Recently in New Zealand, we had a foodborne recall from Lida Brand, one of, uh, one of the biggest lettuce producing companies in the country. So. Um, the sources of contamination for these bacteria is everywhere in the lettuce chain. So just ideally, it's better you grow your own lettuce than you use it. But let's say you can't, or let's say somebody says, I don't have uh, the garden uh, or the space. Would you advise that I wash my lettuce even after it comes pre-washed? Yes, that's, that's very true. And you should wash and you should wash it very well, not just any ordinary washing. You should wash it very well. And if possible, in some countries, they cook some vegetables. They, they, they cook it that way because high temperatures are able to kill the bacteria. And at the same time, you don't, have to, you don't want to lose your nutrients because if you overcook them, you lose all the nutrients in the right. vegetables. So you should just be extra careful and extra vigilant on food safety, especially on this issue. Interesting. What about like a cooked carrot? Uh, if you cook it too much, I assume then you lose all the nutrients as you just referenced. That's true, that's true. But um, carrot is one vegetable which has antimicrobial properties. Unlike lettuce, carrot research has proven that some carrot juice can help to prevent bacterial contamination. But yet still, um, bacteria when they are, can, able, can be able to colonize the surface of carrot when the conditions are favorable or conducive for them. Hmm. Well, that was interesting. I guess the other question I, I'd be interested in, if I could ask either of you or both of you, uh, is the labeling on food. So we, the, I believe in the United States it's called the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, we have these uh, ways to mark uh, that on food. Is that the case throughout the world? Yeah, um, that's true. Unfortunately, in my, in my country, in Ghana, we have the Food Regulatory Agency, but the tools and equipments and the protocols they have they are not able to, or they don't have the capability to enumerate or to track down all foodborne diseases. So there are a lot of foodborne diseases in Ghana which are go unreported, basically because people, the people who are involved or who are infected, they don't go to the hospital and they don't, or the doctors don't have the tools to evaluate or to enumerate what where the disease came from. So that's one thing. The CDC is more advanced, where they publicly they have all their data available for each and every one to assess which we don't have such um, systems for control. Well, what about the political issue here? Because let's assume that I ran a, 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 a big cruise ship and people got sick on the cruise ship, I would have a vested interest in, 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 in not sharing with the world that a thousand people just got sick on XYZ ship. Yeah, when it comes to politics, people pay more attention to it because they know it's about politics, it's about voting, it's about election, and they want to win with more people. So when, when, in case, whenever there is an issue, let's say there's an outbreak, and a politician comes out to say, oh, I'll help to, um, um, help, I'll help to control and 
give more facilities to the food industry or the food regulatory agency so that they can carry out their work effectively then because there is a there is, because there is an outbreak people will tend to listen to him and vote for him and he will when he comes to power he will try to um, do things improved upon things but if it's not politics people really don't have much interest in so that's an interesting point so there's almost a political pressure that's to true. to have more uh, influence in the in, exactly. in the arena. Exactly, that's true. And another thing with food safety is about the companies. Like in some countries, if you are a company and there is a food contamination source track or traced back to your company, you may even be fined by the law court. They may ask you to stop production and which may incur costs. This company is going to suffer. So the advanced countries have um, make sure they have food safety um, uh, regulation so that they don't suffer cost at the end of the day. Unlike in other countries where there is a company, there is a foodborne contamination, but they cannot even trace that it's from this or because they don't have the facilities available. So that's another issue with food safety. Thank you both. Okay. If you would like additional information about the food safety program at uh, Massey University in New Zealand, please visit massey.ac.nz. If you would like to send a message to our viewer mailbox, please do so at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.